Tonight, Bastille Day terror attack. More than 80 people killed in Nice as a truck plows through a crowd. An assault on a way of life, people from around the world voice solidarity with France. In other news, the brother of an Islamic State fighter released from jail after the parole authority said he could be radicalised behind bars. And a portrait of Barry Humphreys, painted by Louise Heerman, takes out this year's Archibald Prize. Good evening, Kumi Taguchi with ABC News. Once again, the people of France have been targeted by a shocking act of terrorism. And once again, the targets were innocent civilians, this time revelers celebrating Bastille Day in Nice. The death toll stands at 84, with 18 more in a critical condition and over 100 others injured. The French president has declared a state of emergency and extended that for another three months and has been holding crisis talks in Paris. The suspect is a 31-year-old French Tunisian, a petty criminal known to police. ABC reporter David Cody was on the promenade in Nice when the attack took place. We'll speak to him in just a moment. But first, this is his report about another violent attack on France. They were supposed to be celebrating. Instead, they ran in fear and panic. The truck seen first moving along the promenade with people giving chase then speeding up towards the thousands gathered for France's National Day. Suddenly, it ploughs into the crowd. The fireworks in the sky competing with gunfire on the ground. Witnesses say the driver was shooting at anyone. The gun battle ending when police shot the driver dead. There were, I'll say, at least 15 shots through the windscreen, uh, windscreen. But not before scores of people were killed. A truck arrived and smashed into everyone. Everyone. Police later found the truck was loaded with weapons and grenades. The attack happened over several kilometres of the French resort town. Around 10.30, the truck turned on to the beachfront Promenade des Anglais. It struck the first spectators just west of the Hotel Negresco. The truck travelled around 60 kilometres an hour, zigzagging across the road for two kilometres and drove onto the footpath for more than a kilometre, mowing down those in its path. It came to a stop only when the driver was killed. Elle est horrifiée. We are horrified by what just happened. This monstrosity that consists of a truck to kill, deliberately kill, dozens of people who are simply there to celebrate Bastille Day. A place for celebration, now a scene of carnage. Dead and wounded left sprawled along the road. Many of those killed were children. A stream of ambulances rushed to and from the chaos. With so many victims, helicopters were sent to assist. For those who escaped, adults, children, in shock by what they'd seen. Three Australians were among the injured. I understand that they were fleeing the scene and sustained minor injuries. French President Francois Hollande has extended the state of emergency imposed after last November's Paris attacks. It is clear it's clear we must do everything to grapple with this scourge of terrorism. Returning to the promenade this morning, there is an uneasy calm. This is a holiday resort on the edge of the French Riviera. People are usually spilling out of cafes onto the footpaths. Now, visitors and locals alike are united in shock, mostly, but also sadness at this tragedy. Yet another attack on France on Bastille Day. Nice is not a big city and it does not attract that much attention. So if it, uh, this can be a target, Anywhere can be a target. An investigation is already underway, and so is the grim task of identifying the dead. And David Cody joins us now from the Promenade in Nice. David, as someone who was in the crowd when this all happened, what did you see? 
Well, I was just returning with thousands of people after watching the Bastille Day fireworks when I saw the truck and I remember thinking that it was very odd to see it there because there were thousands of people around it and it was in an area that was meant to be shut down for just for pedestrian traffic. Uh, and that's when the panic really started to kick in. People started screaming and running and I joined them. I turned the corner trying to get as far away as possible from the promenade. Uh, people were tripping over and with each bang we heard behind us, which I now know were gunshots, the panic in the crowd increased. People were trying to get inside, take shelter wherever they could. They were going in hotel lobbies, into restaurants, just trying to get away from the streets. David Cody there. The French government says it's engaged in a war against terrorism. Hundreds of innocent civilians have been killed in violent attacks in the last 18 months. And as James Thomas reports, this latest assault has been felt far beyond French borders. The aftermath. A chilling portrait of bloodshed on a day of celebration. An attack on a way of life. It's a tragic paradox that the subject of, of the attack were people celebrating liberty, equality and, and fraternity. As news spread, global leaders voiced solidarity with France. Together with many, many others, I am convinced that despite the difficulties, we will win this fight. In a statement, US President Barack Obama said the country stood with its oldest ally, saying, we know that the character of the French Republic will endure long after this devastating and tragic loss of life. And France has been here before. At least a dozen attacks perpetrated or foiled in 18 months. In January 2015, two armed extremists killed 12 people at the satirical publisher Charlie Hebdo. In November, nine terrorists linked to the Islamic State group attacked the Bataclan Concert Hall and restaurants in Paris, killing 130 people. The extension of France's state of emergency means more police, with greater powers, conducting more raids. One of France's biggest problems right now is the degree of homegrown terrorism. We're rising from uh, a Muslim community of five million people, uh, of, of whom a number have radicalised. It's like if you were uh, being uh, attacked on, on the day of your uh, birthday. Australia's French ambassador expressed pain and defiance. We are not afraid. You can hurt us, you can eat us, you can drive trucks in our uh, people, you can kill 80 of us, but we shall not surrender. In Australia, Bastille Day celebrations have continued and throughout the day we've met people full of shock and sadness, but also an underlying sense, almost a weary and reluctant acceptance that this attack on the French way of life is not going to stop anytime soon. I think there will be a lot of time before it's stopped. It's, it's global. I it just feel like this, we, we can't really enjoy anything French anymore. Or, you know, not French, but just celebrate, you know, our um, culture and things like that without being um, in danger. I feel pain and so no words to describe this. A long way from home, but united in grief. James Thomas, ABC News. A French festival in Sydney is tonight holding a candlelight vigil to unite in the face of the tragedy. Jackson Vernon is at the festival. Uh, Jackson, people were meant to be celebrating Bastille Day, but now there's a much more sombre mood. Good evening, Kumi. You're right. I'm down here at a local festival being held as part of Bastille Day celebrations, but it has now taken a more serious tone given the events in Nice overnight. Hundreds of people have gathered out the front of Customs House here, and it has been a really emotional event just in the last couple of minutes. People are gathered here, linked in arms, crying, holding candles, coming together to stand in solidarity with the people of France and to show this as a mark of respect for the victims of the attack. I've had a chance to speak to a couple of French residents who are here on holidays and they're still coming to terms with the gravity of what's occurred overseas overnight and it goes wider than that. There are thousands of French born people living in New South Wales, many of them residing here in Sydney and they're still coming to terms grappling with the enormity of what's happened. And Jackson, this isn't the only tribute in Sydney. Yeah, right across Sydney there's been tributes to uh, show uh, was a mark of respect to what's happened 
uh, in Sydney today, a flag, the French flag was raised above the Sydney Harbour Bridge and across Sydney uh, the colours of the French flag have been lit up on buildings right across Sydney including the council chambers in Randwick. The Mayor says they've got a large French community living in that area so this has really struck a chord with those people there. Jackson Vernon, thank you. The brother of Islamic State fighter Mohammed Elamar will be released from jail after the parole authority suggested he could be radicalised if he remains in prison. Ahmed Elamar has spent more than two and a half years in Goulburn jail for bashing a policeman. The prison's boss fought Elamar's release, saying he's already a threat to the community. Alex MacDonald has more. A professional fighter at 15, Ahmed Elamar has earned a reputation for violence. He was among a group of men enraged by a film they saw as an insult to Muslims. When the protest spilled onto George Street, Ahmed Elamar bashed an officer with a wooden pole. He pleaded guilty and was jailed for two and a half years. Today, the parole authority granted his release. Are you pleased with today's result? At today's hearing, Justice Graham Barr said that Elamar had been confined in the presence of inmates who may have radical beliefs. He said the community would be better served if Elamar was removed. The New South Wales Corrective Services Commissioner wanted Elamar to undergo a de-radicalisation program before being released. Clearly, the Baird government's so-called de-radicalisation programs are not working. This man should serve his full sentence. The head of Corrective Services argued that Elamar was already radicalised and was one of several inmates who tried to impose Sharia law inside Goulburn Jail. In his submission, the Corrective Services Commissioner said that Ahmed Elamar was part of a group of inmates who spoke about beheading someone in September last year. Elamar is due to be released in the next week and will be monitored electronically during an extended period of parole. The acting Premier, Troy Grant, is seeking advice on whether it's possible to appeal the decision. Alex MacDonald, ABC News, Sydney. A Lebanese judge has approved bail for the former Australian soldier who organised a botched child recovery operation for Channel 9. The decision paves the way for Adam Whittington to leave the country as soon as next week. Middle East correspondent Matt Brown reports from Beirut. For the family and friends of Adam Whittington on the Gold Coast, it's time to celebrate. He's coming home, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, he's coming home. And back. I go, ah! He's coming home. His mother heard the news this morning that her son could soon be free. So good. Really, really good. I missed him. I just missed hearing his voice. A judge in Beirut has granted Whittington bail of $26,000. The dual British-Australian national has been in Lebanese custody since the botched 60 Minutes operation in April to snatch the children of Brisbane mother Sally Faulkner. And he is ready to face all the decisions of the courts and he's ready to answer all the questions and to cooperate with the system, the system of Lebanon, the rule of law of Lebanon. The former Australian soldier was hired by Channel 9 to organise the recovery and escape but was charged with kidnapping when the team was caught. The Channel 9 crew and Ms Faulkner were released three months ago after a deal was struck with her estranged husband. But Whittington and three other alleged members of his child recovery team were denied bail and face an uncertain future. If all goes according to plan, Adam Whittington's lawyer will pay his bail today and he'll be free to leave the country by the middle of next week. Matt Brown, ABC News, Beirut. A medical trainee who was drugged and indecently assaulted by a Sydney oncologist says the incident has left her world broken. John Kersley now faces a possible jail sentence for targeting a young woman who had once held him in high regard. John Kersley was once a leader in his field, but his distinguished career is now in tatters. In 2013, he slipped the sedative benzodiazepine into a glass of wine at his home during a visit by a registrar he'd been working with. He then proceeded to indecently assault her. At the time, he was the director of radiation oncology at St George Hospital. In a victim impact statement read by a friend, the woman said, everything changed my whole belief system collapsed. She said she knew that by reporting what happened, she risked being labelled a troublemaker. 
There is an obvious power imbalance and I couldn't help but feel small. She's since received a letter from Kersley but says it only offered excuses about his work, stress and alcohol consumption. He is unwilling to take responsibility for his actions and I can't help thinking that he is insulting my intelligence. Kersley hasn't worked at the hospital since February 2014 and was sacked after his guilty plea last October. An appointment by the University of New South Wales was also withdrawn and his medical registration was suspended. But John Kersley still enjoys some support among former colleagues, two of whom agreed to give evidence of his good character. Speech pathologist Julia McLean said the behaviour was hard to reconcile with a man she's known for 19 years. The case will return to court next month. Carl Herr, ABC News. A portrait of Barry Humphreys has won this year's Archibald Prize. Melbourne painter Louise Heerman collected the $100,000 in prize money in what was a golden year for female artists. The 51 finalists in this year's Archibald Prize had a variety of styles. They ranged from striking realistic images to a surreal work made up of plants and animals introduced into Australia. The trustees from the New South Wales Art Gallery settled on a luminous portrait of a genuine Australian superstar. And the prize money of $100,000 goes to Louise Heerman for the portrait of Carrie Humphreys. It took Melbourne artist Louise Heerman a number of sittings over several years to get the entertainer, satirist and artist just right. I had to keep waiting for Barry to come back from overseas to Australia and I had to go up to his face and look into his eyes and try and work out what colour they were. He was a very difficult person to paint. She says the wind secures her ability to continue working in Australia. It's sad that a lot of artists have to go overseas to uh, make a living here. Yeah. It's sad, we've lost so much talent. As if to prove the point, the subject himself was not there to reflect any of the glory. He was asleep in his home in the UK when the announcement was made. Not missing out on the announcement was a group of Aboriginal artists from the far north of South Australia. The sisters' collaborative canvas about members of a family protecting each other won the win prize. We are proud, happy. And the sisterhood had plenty else to celebrate. Women have won all of the prizes this year, the Archibald, the Win, and the Sawman prizes. It's the first clean sweep in the competition's history. David Spicer, ABC News, Sydney. The global rally in shares continued driving the Australian market to its high for the year. Stronger than expected Chinese growth numbers also helped underpin the market. Here's Philip Lasker. Chinese authorities have had a bit of trouble controlling the share market, but they do do a good job on growth. The Chinese economy grew at 6.7% in the year to June. It's been an extremely gradual, just what the doctor ordered, slowdown during the past four years. But it comes at a cost. The government is keeping things afloat. State-owned businesses are ramping up investment while private sector capital spending is falling away. Credit is expanding at a faster rate than the real economy, so the debt problems are being pushed out into the future. The Brits, on the other hand, like a bit of excitement. This is the post-Brexit UK growth forecast. Yet the Bank of England did not cut interest rates overnight. It will do something next month, but essentially the bank needs more time to assess the fallout and develop a package of stimulus measures. That decision not to cut rates took the edge off markets in Europe. But here in Asia, Wall Street's record and the China numbers were seen as a positive. And it's seven rises in a row for the Australian market, a run that's occurred only five times in the past three years. The All Ordinaries Index gained more than 3% this week. Bank shares led the market higher. Resources were mixed, with gold stocks taking a tumble because of the more positive mood. It's been a volatile day for the Australian dollar. It spiked at 76.7 US cents after the China GDP numbers before falling half a cent. And that's finance. Perth has stolen one of the biggest rugby league matches from the game's East Coast heartland. The second state of origin match in 2019 will be played in a brand new West Coast stadium. New South Wales will spend a billion dollars on its own venues to compete, but the sports minister says only time will tell if fans will fork out to travel across the country. No inquiry.
Oh, I think that's a good question for the NRL. We know we put on great product and people turn up in Sydney. Uh, if they want to showcase their product in other locations, um, that's up to them. New South Wales and Queensland have traditionally taken turns to host, although Melbourne has snatched the rights before. It has been some extraordinary scenes on the 12th stage of Tour de France on Mont Ventoux. Australia's Richie Porte crashed into a motorbike and in the ensuing chaos, race leader Chris Froome was forced to abandon his bike and had to resort to running up the mountain. Daniela Intilli reports. The most famous mountain in the most famous race has never witnessed mayhem like this. This is unbelievable. You can run all you like, but the rules state you've got to have your bike with you. He hasn't got his bike. Tens of thousands of overzealous spectators lining the narrow road resulted in Australia's Richie Port crashing headfirst into a TV motorbike, which had stopped suddenly. There was nothing he could do. And the debacle came just as Port was pulling away from the peloton. And that's not right. It, it can't be... It just can't stand, I think, that the motorbike and the crowd just ruin the race like that. I'm not just whinging because it's me, but I just don't think that that's right. The pile-up also brought down race leader Chris Froome, whose bike was destroyed. The three of us, uh, Molema, Richie and myself, just went piling over the back of the motorbike and another motorbike came into the back of me and, and broke my frame. So uh, I was just left running, really. A replacement machine was unrideable. The bike isn't even working. A yellow jersey has been given a bike that's absolutely useless. The British rider lost a minute off his overall lead but retained the yellow jersey after he and Port were given a revised time. So I'm just glad to get through this stage. I mean, uh, I'm glad that the, the commissaires uh, took, took that decision there. I think, I mean, in the interest of the race, interest of also what's, what's happened the last few days, I think that was, that was the correct decision. Belgian's Thomas de Hent won the stage, unaware of the chaos behind. Australia's Simon Gerrans was forced to quit the tour after breaking his collarbone in a separate crash. Daniela Intilli, ABC News. It's not often a golfer hits a course record then says he wants to cry, but Phil Mickelson had that sort of day in the opening round of the British Open. Mickelson hit 63, one shot off setting a new record for a round at a major. He had to settle for eight under, three shots ahead of the closest competition. Ben Worsley reports. Golf, as Phil Mickelson well knows, is cruel. After a flawless round, the American missed one putt. Oh, no! And finished the day in bitter disappointment. A putt to make golfing history and it rims out on the 18th hole. Instead of becoming the first player to hit a round of 62 in a major, Mickelson's now the 28th to card a 63. Unreal. I want to cry. This ball was hunting right in the centre and didn't go, it's just heartbreaking. His round included eight birdies and not a single blemish. His putting was close to perfect. I don't believe it. Off the tee, he attacked at every opportunity. Oh, what a shot from Mickelson. My goodness, he's just played magnificently today. And when he got in trouble, he got out of it. Just a genius. Mickelson did make some history. His 63 is a course record at Royal Troon. A wonderful round of golf. And how did that stay out for a 62? The best of the Australians are six shots back. Matt Jones hit five birdies on the front nine before fading. Oh, my goodness. Oh, Matty Jones. While Adam Scott took time to get going, but finished strongly also on two under. Fabulous shot. The 2010 Open winner. South African Louis Oosthuizen isn't troubling the leaders, but he did contribute the highlight of the round. Producing a hole in one. Ben Worsley, ABC News. In Super Rugby, the Waratahs finals hopes have been dashed with a 34 to 28 loss to the Blues. New South Wales needed a bonus point victory at Edens Park Graveyard to keep its playoff chances alive. After trailing the Blues 12 to 7 at half time, the Tars reduced the margin to one point in the second. You talk about your stars, there's the biggest of the lot. But the hosts scored late to end the Waratahs' hopes. The results mean that the Brumbies can still claim top spot on the Australian Conference when they play the force tomorrow night. One of Australia's best-known socialites and former political wives has died at the age of 74. Lady Susan Renouf was diagnosed with ovarian cancer in 2013. 
Friends and family are remembering an engaging and lively woman who kept her bright spirit to the end. A photo on social media and a message about a mother adored by three daughters. Lady Susan Renouf's life was filled with exuberance. Being a Melbourne girl, I just love being here. I encourage and enjoy all my overseas and interstate friends to be with me. She was well known for her collection of hats and husbands, first marrying politician Andrew Peacock in 1963. I think that was much more a partnership in politics. She then wed British racing and gambling tycoon Robert Sangster in 1978. He bought her a Sydney harbourfront mansion for her 40th birthday in the early 1980s, but soon after their marriage was on the rocks. He later sold the home to her third husband, New Zealand financier Sir Frank Renouf, for a then record $8 million. What does the future hold for you now? Just being happy and being with the person I want to be happy with. That happiness was also short-lived. A few years later, Lady Susan Renouf was heading to the divorce courts. I had to not use imagination and style. I had to fight the good fight with all my might. While Susan Renouf is remembered for her love of fashion and art, she did consider a move into politics. But people don't realise she's actually highly intelligent as well. And that's a side of it that people don't really focus on much. In 2013, Lady Renouf was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. She saw it as an opportunity to raise awareness of the disease. Susan was given a terminal diagnosis and the way she's reacted to that has been amazing. Lady Susan Renouf is survived by her three daughters. To the weather now, and are these frosty mornings going to stay through the weekend, Graham? We've got a very frosty start across all of the state tomorrow, but by Sunday they really are just contracting back to the tableland. So there is a little bit of relief for those of you that don't like the cold. Badgerys Creek, Camden and Richmond all recorded sub-zero minimums this morning and it actually fell to minus 1.9 at Richmond. That was the coldest across Sydney. Our tops, though, in total opposite, above average, ranging from 16 to 18. And frost was fairly widespread across the state. Gunnedah, along with Cooma and Threadbow, all recorded minus six degrees this morning. Winds returned back to light across the state. And despite some cloud about the north, there's been no rain, although there was an early shower out Mount Janini, and that's on the ACT border. That only produced a light two millimetre fall. Now, the cloud to the north is going to produce some heavy falls in Queensland, but really the only potential for falls in New South Wales is just about the far northern border. The stabilising high pressure system remains the dominant feature and as it moves east it's going to draw some warmer air into the state. That's what's going to help push temperatures back into more spring-like territory by early next week. Now rain and heavy falls are expected in Queensland, also through the southwest of Western Australia. Should be mostly light rainfall though in Brisbane. Fog and frost expected across most of the southeastern cities. Now as that high pressure system moves east, winds will start to tend briefly onshore. So that's just going to bring a very low chance of an isolated coastal shower north of about Nelson Bay and uh, they're also going to be a little bit more likely Sunday morning. But in the northeast, morning frost and fog, a cloudy day in the north, tending sunnier further south, should be mostly dry apart from very light and isolated showers, mostly light to moderate southeast winds, they'll be strongest north of Yamba. And some widespread frost across the southeast, anywhere away from the coast, should be dry, mostly sunny, generally light winds throughout, and those strongest of the winds will actually be south of Green Cape, but they'll also ease in the afternoon. The widespread frost and some areas of fogs over the inland. We've got sunny conditions, although there will be a little bit of cloud about the north, and perhaps the northern slopes could see a very light shower. So in Sydney, we've got overnight lows of 1 to 8 degrees. Tops will reach 17 to 18. Some morning frost, then a mostly sunny day. We've also got light winds, but they will reach light to moderate at times on the coastal waters. The season swells also looking pretty good at this stage. As we move into Sunday, we see the minimums and the maximums pushing up into 20 degrees across most of Sydney and it gets even warmer on Monday, Tuesday. Some warmer tropical air begins to move down. With that, we see some cloud and showers building Wednesday, Thursday. And Kumi, it looks as though we could see some fairly widespread shower activity towards the middle of the week. Still a little bit uncertain as to uh, how much rain, but definitely a lot warmer. Okay, thanks so much, Graham.
Before we go, let's recap tonight's top story. 84 people have been killed and hundreds of others injured after a terror attack in the French city of Nice. A truck ploughed through crowds at Bastille Day celebrations. The driver of the truck has been identified as a 31-year-old French Tunisian who lives in Nice. Police have been raiding his home and say he is known to them as a petty criminal. The French president, Francois Hollande, is expected to arrive in Nice within the next few hours. That's ABC News for this Friday. Thanks for your company. Do stay with us for 7.30 with Matt Wordsworth.